I was standing closer, and I don't know who was playing what parts either, <laughs> but it was gorgeous, wonderful. And I'm glad, too, that we have harps this side of heaven and that we can enjoy this uh, celestial music as we have. And for the worship leaders and participants today, thank you so much for leading us and Bruce for your prayer. Um, the, our computer apparently is on the fritz and that's why we don't have the projected music today, but I'm kind of glad in that you can take home the words of the sermon in the music that you have in your bulletin this morning. And I hope you will do that and look at it because I'm not going to say anything new. We are all sinners, we're all sorts, and we're all saints on this All Saints Sunday. I don't know when it was that hallowed evening got corrupted to Halloween. In more ways than one, you might uh, argue. But this is a day for saints. This is the day after the uh, Celtic uh, division time of Samhain where the harvest is in and now we hunker down for winter and uh, for the lights of Christmas. You know that I'm mostly depressed in November. <laughs> I don't think it's clinical. Jane may uh, disagree. <laughs> um, especially when the leaves have fallen, the color's gone, and it's rainy and gray and drizzly, and the day is not very long at all. It's dark at both ends, and it's not yet Christmas. But each year I survive, if you noticed. And uh, here, we, here we are uh, entering this, uh, I think, special period of time. My text this morning is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And uh, just the first 12 verses, the story's longer, but I think we'll get to the meat of it uh, uh, as we read this. And, and this is the story of, of the Lord Jesus uh, a, a calling to himself and commissioning uh, not this time 12 apostles of the disciples in a larger group, but this time 70 of the disciples. The text is 72. Some of the texts say 72 and some say 70. And in a moment, I'll tell you why I think it's 70. The Lord appointed 70 disciples and sent them out in pairs ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. And don't take a purse or bag or sandals and don't greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there. Eat and drink whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. And don't move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what's offered. Heal the sick there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. But be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Is that really all it takes for the kingdom of God to come near? For you to pretend that you're a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon for one night and to knock on somebody's door and say, peace to this house, would that get it done? Is that all it is? Some happy, peaceful, hope. Dr. Luke picks up the story of Jesus commissioning these 70 disciples, and some of the, uh, well, 70 is one of the favorite numbers of the Jewish people, particularly in the Old Testament. It was the number of the uh, group, uh, the, 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 the family of, of Jacob that went down to Israel, about 70 of them. In the time of Joseph, because of the famine, and there they would find the sustenance and they, they would need for survival. And it was 70 that uh, Moses called. Jesus is greater than Moses, but the Old Testament leader of Moses is always revered. The one who led them out of exile, the people of God out of exile. And he called 70 to help him judge and to lead Israel. 
when he was trying to do it all himself. And his father-in-law said, well, that's not working, is it? And then there were 70 in the Sanhedrin, which was the council in Jerusalem in Jesus' day that really called the shots and told everybody what they should do. And here Jesus is sending 70 people out. And he's not going to Jerusalem, although he's going to get there. He's sending them out to all the towns and the villages where he's going to go, bringing himself and his message. He's sending them on ahead to prepare the way like John, perhaps, to give in essence what the message is going to be so they could check it out early, decide yes or no. But here they are in this gospel. And, and, and he adds these words, which I think are strange in some way, where he says, don't, don't, take, don't take anything with you. And some passages say, don't take a sword. No way of protecting yourself. Don't take a script. Don't take your money bag. Don't take a pouch. Don't be prepared for what you're going to say. And don't stop and chit-chat along the way. Can we say that there's some matter of urgency here? And can we also say that in the day and the weeks that lie ahead, God knows what's going to happen in your life, and there are many ways in which you cannot prepare. And when you sell out to Christ and to His will and to what He wants for the day, it's not fatalism when you're walking and talking with the Savior. Trusting that he'll give you the words to say at the right time, that he'll provide for you at the right time, that the right people will come along and, and, and provide for your needs. The birds don't worry about it, said Jesus. How come we spend so much time worrying about such things? Don't stop for anybody on the road. I like that. Well, what about the Samaritan who might be happening there lying in the ditch? Well, you know, can we make an exception? Yes. The major point is get on with the task of telling people about Jesus and about his life and his ministry here on earth. The time is ripe, Jesus is saying. The harvest is ready. This is the opportune time. Pity there's not more harvesters. When Jesus talks about the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, he was not meaning that the church should sit like some lump on a rock and fight off all the opposition that happens as it does in every age and every culture. He's saying the gates of hell will not prevail, meaning won't be able to withstand the advance of the kingdom through the people of God and through their ministry. And here I think is the same sort of thing. The harvest is ready. The problem isn't that there's nobody who believes or wants to believe. It's that they have not heard. How can they believe, says Paul in Romans, unless they hear? And how will they hear unless we tell them? And how will we tell them unless we send them? And I'm telling you, I'm sending you today to show and tell the gospel somewhere. As Bruce has already so beautifully prayed it. Somebody in the next decks, the next workplace, someone next to you, where you work or where you work out. It's your opportunity to live Jesus before them. Uh, this morning I want us, in a sense, to imagine, because I think we could be more creative and imaginative about what it would look like if this world really was right side up. What it would look like in your life and in your home and in your neighborhood and in the wider spheres as we go out, what it would look like in our whole globe, our whole earth. There are two men standing there in the door, knocking at the door. I say, it's not Jehovah's Witnesses, though this is where they got the idea. And they're not soliciting your support for a political party, and they're not suggesting you need to help in finding if your house is eco-friendly or not, because they can help you with that. Or if your water heater or furnace needs to be replaced, because after all, it's been how many years? And it's not just that they have a great idea and deal for you and how you can save money on your gas bill by switching over to them. The interruption to our meal, the interruption to the sports program or to the, that we're watching or to the newspaper that we're perusing is this. Somebody knocks at the door and says, peace. Peace to this home. Peace to this house. Now, we can't imagine it because the word has been, become cheap in many ways, although we long for it at heart. Peace to you, peace to you. In the words of Shania Twain, that may not impress you much. But it would have impressed the occupants of the houses in Jesus' day. 
For it was almost like a code word. For the one who would come to Israel would be a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the ones who rejected the message that day with the two standing at the door and who might ultimately reject Jesus did so not because they didn't believe in the message or that God would come through someday, but they didn't believe that it was in these two guys at the door. They didn't even thought to bring a script with them or anything else that would help. I'll tell you, when you're a missionary, you're vulnerable. When you're home here, we can say, well, we have a lovely church, a lovely program, so we have all this stuff, and we could just do better PR or just have the, just invite people. We could fill this place and build, build our church. And that's how the West has been won. <laughs> Missionaries know that it doesn't work. You've got to go to them. You've got to be on their turf, learn their language and their culture. Like Jesus, you're embedded in another culture. Jesus, for 30 years before he comes forth in his ministry. And so we go on to their turf where we don't know the language or the music and not sure we like it. Which is different than having people fit in, you know, and then we'll let them join us, maybe. Peace. That's the message. Leave me in peace. Stop the war. Peace in our time. All we're saying is give peace a chance. Imagine a world without borders and nations where religious hostility was gone, where there was no such thing. The Beatles tried to say that. John Lennon said that. Imagine, well, let me read it. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. We say, what a rascal. He didn't believe in heaven or hell. No, what he's saying was, is maybe today, what he was saying was, so many of us live for heaven or hell in the future and don't live for our neighbor today. Don't live this day, even for ourselves. Aren't here, aren't present, aren't involved. Imagine all the people, he says, living for today. And imagine there's no countries It isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine not going after the things that we think we have to have to survive. Imagine no possessions. He says, I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live us one. You know, there are people who don't know Jesus or follow Jesus, and I don't know where John is or was with that. But there's something deep within the hearts of everybody who knows this world is out of joint and longs for it to be made right and to be made real. And in fact, the word peace for the Jewish people is much deeper than the absence of war and hostility. We know that we are to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ who has reconciled us and brought us together through the atonement or the atonement which we will celebrate this morning. We have peace with God. We have peace within. Jesus calms either the storm within or the storm without. Either way, Jesus' presence is with us. He's not asleep. Or peace in the Jewish concept was shalom. The Hebrew, in the Hebrew, it meant so much more. It included peace, yes, as we would expect it, but it, 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 it included the planet right side up, the planet ruined, the planted that could be redeemed, a planet where people had fallen and creation had been marred, but a planet where people could flourish once more again and creation properly be marshaled and managed for the, greater's, for the Creator's glory and for all of our good on earth. But how is it to happen? By whom is it to happen? When is it to happen? How would God come? How would God show up and fix the problem for everything is in a mess? The knock on the door that that day was to announce to people in all kinds of situations in every imaginable state of belief that God's kingdom was near. In fact, that God's kingdom was coming, that in Jesus, the King, The kingdom so long promised in all the Old Testament prophecies was about to come to their town, about to come to their village. That in Jesus, through his life and work and by his death and resurrection, it had all begun. The kingdom had come. 
For centuries, Old Testament Israel had been saturated with promises of God's intervention in their lives and in their nation, in fact, in the whole world. And now, in the manner and message of Jesus, the kingdom has arrived. Jesus was the enactor of God's rule. As uh, N.T. Wright says, it's when God became king, when they recognized that he is king of the world, that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Now, you have to imagine this because all around us is evidence to the contrary. Faith doesn't mean that immediately you can see, well, well, that's obvious. I mean, look at Jesus. What's obvious about him is he's hanging on a tree. What's obvious about him is that he failed. Or did he? What's obvious is that all the people who thought he was Mr. Wonderful, that he was king, that he was Messiah, they all ran away. It, it takes a Holy Spirited imagination and a belief and then action to believe this in our own life in such a way that we'll actually live and do something besides sing about it that will make a difference in our world. If Jesus is king, in your life, if Jesus is king of this world, of this city, of this nation, what does it mean? Well, certainly we have to say that it's about this earth, not only about the life to come. When Jesus talks about you'll have life and have it more abundantly, most of the time in my upbringing, that was about abandon this world. You've got to escape this world. This old ship's going down. You've got to get saved so you can get out of here. And you need to get as many people as you can and snatch them from the fire or from the waves and bring them with you. We're back to Noah's day, and the whole world's flooded with excess and with evil, and we got to get out of here. But that's not the message if you read all of the Old Testament because it's about God redeeming and renewing this here earth. It's not about our escaping to heaven. It's about Jesus coming and colonizing this earth with heaven. So that right here and now, in your life and mine, and everywhere we have a sphere of influence, God's rule, God's kingdom, God's will gets done as it is in heaven. It's the reverse of a lot of evangelical thought that we need to be getting people out of here. Now, I know that some of the saints are in glory, and I know that they're waiting the fulfillment of this because the kingdom has not yet fully come, although it's been introduced in the king. And the kingdom has been greatly influencing our world since the time of Jesus because the early church actually believed this and lived it out and even died for it and turned their world upside down so that like a spreading flame. Christendom, you can argue that was... Constantine, you could argue it was God. You could argue that all through history, now millions, is it billions of people have come to know Jesus and lived in such a way that it changed their life and the life of others. It's, it's like there's this huge dark forest, and in the little sphere that is their life, with God's help and with their giftedness and Holy Spirited obedience, they have carved a clearing out of the woods so that the light might shine, that they might grow things, so they might bless people. And when they die and go and nobody follows them, perhaps at the encroachment of the weeds and the saplings, and, and, and you never know they were there in less than 100 years. Jesus is king, but his body is the church in which we are members, and Jesus continues his work today. We don't bring in the kingdom. Jesus does. He's the king. But we work towards it. We set up signposts of it coming. We, we, we make, I pray, we make people hungry and thirsty for a right side up world that comes in knowing and following and loving and obeying Jesus Christ. They want to get in on the blessing. And so we are called to invite others to join in this way, this Jesus way, this king's way where that idea come from and lead others not a way to glory but to the restoration of this world which will finally happen of course when Jesus comes 
Again, N.T. Wright, this whole agenda of dealing with sin and all its effects and consequences was never about rescuing individual souls from the world, but about saving humans so that they could become part of the project of saving the world. Are you part of the project of saving the world? Are you part of the project of announcing that Jesus is King and Lord? Does something show about your life that that's true? Anything as you verbalize it that says that's true, that you've taken your commitment and your stand individually and as a body with a local church, part of the universal church around the world and of all time. Salvation that is not just going to heaven, although it's that, but being raised to life in God's new heaven and new earth. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. That's what the Lord's Prayer is about. So what's our role in this? As Jesus' disciples, we are called to, we are commissioned, and we are sent out, or if you have to, stay at home, to declare not just a shallow kind of peace, but a deep shalom that is about every aspect of human life and flourishing on this planet. It's about people and places and things. It's about everything that's been created that God said is good. And he hasn't abandoned us and he hasn't left us on our own devices. He's come and he's entered in again with us, been vindicated by the Father, raised from the dead, despite the fact that he was put to death in this horrendous way. And as you paint or preach or sing or sow or pray or teach or build hospitals or dig walls or campaign for justice or write poems or care for the needy or love your neighbor as yourself, this will last into God's future. This is part of the gold that will not be burned up on the last day like the wood and hay and stubble. We are building to God's kingdom. I've said, I think, earlier here in this church that it's never too late to find your vocation. Your jobs may change over the years. You may have different manifestations of your vocation. It's never too late to find out who you are and what, in essence, God is wanting you to be because you might be doing this for eternity for many, 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 many ages. That's hope for if we're 75 or 90 or whatever age we are. This isn't the end when we come to the end. God is going to renew and redeem this whole world. He's begun it already in Jesus Christ. I've been a friend for many years with, uh, since Calgary days, with a pastor who's now in Vancouver. His name is Tim DeCow. And yes, he's Wayne's cousin. And for over nearly 30 years, he's been the pastor of Calvary Grandview Baptist Church in East Vancouver, which is a rough area of the city, now becoming gentrified. And not long ago, t- Tim wrote a book describing his time in ministry in and with that church, and he called it Plunging into the Kingdom Way. And Tim and that church have done that. Mary, his wife, used to babysit. Lawrence Evans' daughter used to babysit our kids in Uxbridge in our first church. It's been a remarkable journey for Tim and for Mary. They've had a determined and sacrificial and quality, difficult, lasting and fruitful ministry. Because they imagined what would happen if they took Jesus seriously and if a whole community took Jesus seriously. You know, Joan Chute, her daughter is part of that congregation tomorrow. They have two or three, four houses in the community. If, if I walk around the community with, with Tim, we never get anywhere because he's the pastor of the community, like Jim Sanderson in Mimico. They've touched that community. They've been embedded in that community. They've gone deep in that community. And they offer not just Jesus saves you, but all the different aspects of life that mean human flourishing and God's kingdom care. And we're doing it here with recess, with Stonegate ministry. All the quality ways in which you are involved, whether you're helping as we gather or helping individually and Together as we scatter the pub ministry, David Upton, play for him. These are exciting, impossible days where airplanes get shot out of the sky by ISIS over the spot where I traveled from Lebanon to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. 
And you never know, and this isn't to scare us, it's just to say we live in a world that where bad things still happen. But can you imagine what would happen if in the midst of whatever could happen in God's providence and care of your life, you determined that you would be God's man or woman, that you would be a subject of the king, that even as you look around with normal eyesight, you saw how horrendous it is, you looked also around with spiritual insight, with imagination, with ears attuned to the silent cries so often of many, and you did something about it, Lord helping us by his spirit to make a difference, to announce that King Jesus is here, and he rules in our life, and one day he will reign in all the hearts of men and women so that every knee will bow and every time confess that he is Lord. This sermon really is a plea that you will believe and trust the good news that it's true that God's kingdom really has come in Jesus. It's been started. It's continuing. It's a plea that you will heed the call to live into it, that you will plunge somehow, that you'll be plunged into kingdom living, the kingdom way. And that you will imagine and become a subject of Jesus and become the difference that will make as you join with him and with others in your home and community where you work and in your world. I think it's true. Can you imagine it with me? Bless you.